Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Sorry, I've had a little bit of issues here. With um, this PowerPoint popping up. See, Rita? All right, well, welcome to Mission West Virginia and our webinar today, Bridging the Divide with Rita Schoolcraft, um, who has been an educator here with Mission for four years, is that right? And now she does, uh, she coordinates our trainings for our educators. Um, so at Mission West Virginia, just wanna do a really quick info or intro. So our mission um, at Mission, is to change the lives of youth and families. We promote positive futures by recruiting foster families, providing life skills education, and creating community connections. We have uh, two programs currently at Mission. The first is our Frameworks program, which provides information and resources to help foster and or adoptive parents become certified. We also help assist families as they take the first steps on their foster adoptive journey. Um, Frameworks also hosts trainings focused on adoption and kinship care. I'm provides sorry having problems with my computer now, um, providing kinship care information manuals and host a lending library of foster adopted materials. If you're interested in uh, fostering, please contact us here at the office at 866-CALL-MWV, or you can reach Cheryl, who is just filled with tons of information and uh, so helpful. And her line is 304-512-0555. You can also request an information packet online. So our THINK program, which is what is bringing you this webinar today, um, is we're a um, healthy relationship education teen pregnancy prevention program. So we've provided 100, over 100,000 students and adults across 29 counties in the state with pregnancy prevention education services since the beginning of the program um, in 2007. So the core areas of focus are preventing teen pregnancy, HIV and STI prevention and education, healthy relationship education, positive youth development, parent and community education. Um, we also mix in quite a bit of other high risk behavior prevention as well. So coming up, we have the THINK conference, May 25th through the 27th. You can find more information about that on our website at missionwv.org. Um, if you click on the THINK tab and then THINK conference, um, there's more information up about that. But a quick overview, um, our five sessions on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday will all be presented by um, Kelly and Becca. So you can look them up. We've had them at a past conference before. They're um, amazing speakers. They are fun and entertaining, but full of great information as well, just the way we like it. So our first one will be uh, called Representation Matters. And updates on that, I believe that one starts at 10 a.m. on May 25th. Um, it might be 11 a.m. And now I can't find my... Or I just printed out for that. Um, so we'll have representation matters on the first day where they will talk about um, inclusivity and, and the importance of that in this day and age. The second session will be that afternoon. It's why what used to work no longer does. So a fresh approach to addressing alcohol and sexual assault. On Wednesday, they're going to just have one presentation on Wednesday, which will be their sex conversations. Um, and that's just a, a neat little kind of like what we're talking about today, but how to open up and have that conversation with your teenagers. Connect, finding connection in virtual spaces um, will be on Thursday morning. And this is just one again, that's um, all about, you know, this digital virtual age that we're, we're trying to um, muddle through right now and how important these connections are. And then our last session with them on Thursday um, is you can't pour from an empty cup, which is going to talk about um, the importance of self-care, especially in the field that we are currently working in. So today's session with Rita does not include CEUs. Um, this was more of a parent presentation. So my apologies if you are here and needed CEUs for today's event. However, our virtual conference that's coming up in two weeks, um, there will be a total of seven and a half CEUs available. Each session will be one and a half hours long. Um, so, and those were are provided through the Office of Maternal Child and Family Health, and they'll be available for nursing and social work. So if you do need CEUs, come see us again in, in two weeks, and we'll be happy to help you out with those. So, 
There's that. I'm going to turn my screen share off. Hello, Rita. Welcome. I'm good. Um, you are muted still. I'm going to mute myself. Guys, thank you all for attending. We appreciate you. If you have any questions, please let us know. I'm going to turn it over to Rita. All right. Good afternoon. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I'm excited to present this information to you. I want to let you know that I am not an expert on teenage conversations, but I do have a little background. As Hillary stated, I have four years as an SRAE. Oh, I should be unmuted. I'm unmuted. Okay. Hopefully, can you all hear me? Maybe give a thumbs up in the chat box. Yes, okay. Um, I was spent four years as an SRA, which is sexual risk avoidance educator with Mission West Virginia. And I recently transitioned into the development trainer position. I also um, have years of experience working with teenagers from the ages of, you know, 10, seven, eight, nine, 10, up through college age. I've done that my whole life as a volunteer. And I have raised two successful teenagers who still talk to me to this day. Not that we didn't have our rough times, but I learned a lot during those times. So I hope you find this information interesting and we will get started. And let me get this here. All right. So that's enough about me. Um, today, we're going to cover very briefly the science behind why your adolescent thinks or doesn't think like an adult, and what are some of the potential pitfalls in the communication um, connections with us. Um, and then I'll cover the practical steps to better communicate with your teen, uh, building or rebuilding the communication relationship to provide tools for hearing, understanding, and to have real conversations, just not talks. And finally, um, ways to find talkable moments, which provide for a natural flow of conversation so it doesn't feel as forced or as um, like we're trying too hard. So if you're ready, we're gonna dive in. All right, I'm gonna, um, um, there's a saying, if men are from, Mars and women are, are from Venus. And that book, if you remember it, I'm kind of dating myself, talks about the different ways that um, males and females connect and communicate and think. Well, actually, um, your teenager sometimes will seem like an alien and that they're a teenager from a galaxy far, far away. You think they speak in a foreign language and you don't possess the code especially when approaching tough topics of discussion as they get older and wondering how the two of you are ever, ever gonna meet in the middle without crashing and burning. Communication challenges. We're gonna watch a short video and it's from, um, from the movie Inside Out, if any of you all have seen that. And it, um, it's, communi does communicating with your family look a little bit like this? And then we will talk about the clip just a little bit.
I live on here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see that we're having issues with the, the audio. So let's try it one more time. I apologize. Let's see what we can do. All right, let's try one more time. Let's try again. I apologize. Just reboot it and see if this works better. So, as it turns out, the green trash can is not recycling. It's for greens, like compost and eggshells. Mm. And the blue one is recycling. And the black one Riley is, is acting so weird. Why is she acting so weird? What do you expect? All the islands are down. Joy would know what to do. That's it. Until she gets back. We just do what Joy would do. Great idea. Anger, fear, disgust. How are we supposed to be happy? Huh? Hey, Riley, I've got good news. I found a junior hockey league right here in San Francisco. And get this, tryouts are tomorrow after school. What luck, right? Hockey. Uh-oh, what do we do? Guys, uh, th th this, uh, here, you, you pretend to be Joy. Wouldn't it be great to be back out on the ice? Oh, yeah, that sounds fantastic. What was that? That wasn't anything like Joy. Uh, because I'm not Joy? Yeah, no kidding. Did you guys pick up on that? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Sure did. Something's wrong. Should we ask her? Let's probe, but keep it subtle so she doesn't notice. So, how was the first day of school? She's probing us. I'm done. You pretend to be Joy. What? Okay. Um, hmm. It was fine, I guess. I don't know. Oh, very smooth. That was just like Joy. Something is definitely going on. She's never acted like this before. What should we do? We're going to find out what's happening, but we'll need support. Signal the husband. Ahem. With a nice pass oh, over the reeds, oh, comes oh, across oh, that oh, right. Ahem. Oh, uh-oh, she's looking at us. Uh, what did she say? What? Oh, oh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Is it garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What? What is it, woman? What? <sighs> He's making that stupid face again. I could strangle him right now. Signal him again. Ah, so, Riley, how was school? Oh, oh, please. Please. Are you kidding me? Before this, we gave up that Brazilian helicopter pilot? Boo, I'll be joy. School was great, all right? Riley, is everything okay? Ah. <sighs> Sir, she just rolled her eyes at us. What is her deal? All right, make a show of force. I don't want to have to put the foot down. No, not the foot. Riley, I do not like this new attitude. Oh, I'll show you attitude, okay? No, 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 stay happy! What is your problem? Just leave me alone. Sir, reporting high levels of sass. Take it to DEFCON 2. You heard that, gentlemen? DEFCON 2. Listen, young lady, I don't know where this disrespectful attitude came from. You want a piece of this, Pops? Come and get it! Yeah, well, well... Here it comes. Prepare the foot. Keys to safe to position. Ready to launch on your command, sir. Just shut up! Fire! That's it. Go to your room. Now. <laughs> foot is down. The foot is down. Yeah! Good job, gentlemen. That could have been a disaster. Well, that was a disaster. Come, fly with me, Gachinda. <sighs> All right. Can anybody relate with that? Some of our conversations seem to, like they go off the rails very quickly. And we wonder how this cute little cuddly toddler that we had that just loves us and was a chatterbox. And we were all the time going, man, will they just not be quiet? All of a sudden they turn into this teenager and we're like, I don't even know what to say, like which subject is safe without an explosion going on. Or, you know, why does they think I'm just trying to help? And you know, there's a big kaboom. So what do we do? Well, the thing of what we need to truly, truly understand, it's all in the brain. 
and no, they haven't lost their minds or their brains, but we really need to delve into what is going on besides all the hormones. A lot of times um, we're very quick, quick to blame it on the hormones that deal with the sexual reproduction organs, but really there's a whole host of hormones that are, that are flooding their bodies and flooding their brains to help them grow. Because as we know, teenagers go through great big physical changes, growth spurts, but their brain is also going through a, an enormous change and their brain is still under, um, under construction. Um, and I put a link here or the web address to um, a YouTube video that I thought if you want to watch later, it's a little long, but it truly goes into the neuroscience behind a teenage brain and why they don't always think the way we think they should think, <laughs> why their brains don't always um, follow the same train of thought and the logic that ours does. And I'm going to give you just um, the cliff note version of what is going on in, your in the teen brain. And we know that advanced brain imaging has revealed that the teenage brain has a lot of plasticity, which means it can change, adapt, and respond to its environment. It's why risk-taking and impulsive behaviors at this age are so prevalent. Um, and this is why peer pressure um, rules at this time of life. Um, and this is according to Francis Jensen, the chair of the neurology department at the Perlman School of Medical uh, Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And the brain doesn't grow like physically in size, like their bodies are changing. It seems like we, you know, our teens wake up and they're an inch taller, but their brain is building in a way that is building connections between the regions. We know the region that, um, that first develops is that emotional region. Um, and it is the, um, the center where Everything is like fight, flight, or freeze. Everything sets them off. They haven't learned self-regulation. Well, the front of the brain that, that takes care of that is the prefrontal lobe, and it's not mature enough yet. It, they do have some ability to reason and to be logical because it is building, but what's happening is those connections from one part of the brain to the other are really slower to build and relay information back and forth. Um, and the self-control part is actually the last part to mature. Um, it's why risk-taking are more common. Um, and it says, Jensen says, it's why my teenage boys, I'm going to read a quote from her, would come home without their textbook and realize at eight o'clock that they have a test the next day. They don't have the fully developed capacity to think ahead of time. They are developing that, but it's not there yet. And this slide goes on and talks about, um, you'll see the limbic brain, which is um, the part that I talked about that matures quickest. It's where emotions live. It's where the fight, flight, or free stress response is. It's the part that is always saying, am I safe? Do people want me? Am I, um, am I good enough? Um, do I fit in? Does that sound like some things that go through your teenager's brain? Mm-hmm. And at the same time, they're trying, the prefrontal cortex is trying to mature. And it is the spot for empathy, insight, response flexibility, emotional regulation. Um, that's why sometimes your adolescent might seem like they're a toddler again. You know, they just haven't really learned that self regulation yet. They're trying, they're working on it. Some days you think, oh, wow, they're doing really well. And other days you think they've reverted back to toddlerhood. It's because that emotion regulation is not fully matured and those connections aren't talking fast enough. Um, body regulation is not there. Morality still hasn't quite matured. So they're not always making decisions. Um, you know, sometimes they'll make decisions that go against everything you've ever taught them. And you're like, what household did you grow up in? Um, it's because that part is still trying to mature. The intuition to be able to see beyond what things, what they look like um, into what they really are. And the attuned communication, and that's the part that we struggle with the most. And it is also the fear modulation. You know, teenage years can be full of a lot of unfounded fears. And you're like, what's going on with you? Like, why are you afraid? Just go try. You know, if you fail, it's okay. 
But to a teenage mind, that part of being able to understand that has not fully developed. And that's, you know, all those higher functions are what is the very, very last to develop. And that's why you as the trusted adult play a big part in keeping those lines of communication open. Um, and that's why it's really important to talk with your team and not just at your team, because basically, just like we know in the, the years between birth and three years old, that we build a large portion of the brain and personality, you are literally helping your teenager build their brain. So don't give up. And once you recognize exactly what it is, I think it makes it just a little bit easier to maintain your sanity through all of this. Um, let's think back to your teenage years. And I put some iconic pictures from each, gener from each generation. And some of us have to go a long way back to remember our teenage years. Some of us not so far. Um, but I want you to think a minute and um, think about what did you worry most about? What caused you the most angst? You know, were there world events that bothered you at the time that you were concerned about? What about your friends? You know, the clothing, the future plans, the money. What subjects did you argue about with your parents the most? And if you don't care, if you would put those in the chat box and if Hillary would call those out to me, that would be amazing. Or you can unmute yourself and share, that would be great too. So nobody argued with their parents? Nobody had communication problems with your parents? I know that I personally struggled with um, communicating what clothes I could wear, what styles I could wear, how late could I stay out? When was I old enough to be able to just hop in the car and go and not really tell them where I was going or when I would be back? Um, you know, who my friends were. Back in the day, we were worried about I don't know, all kinds of things. There was a big distrust of the government back then, always worried about, um, you know, grades, what my future was gonna be like, and how was I gonna make money? What was my career choices? My dad and I disagreed about what my career choices would be, or how I spent my time, or how I did or did not do laundry, you know, simple things like that. Well, guess what? Not much has changed throughout the years. Kid, teenagers still worry about balancing life and responsibilities with homework, family life. A lot of them have jobs. Um, there's a big push to worry about, you know, what, what are they gonna do? What college are they going to? What career are they going to? What skills do I need? You know, what SAT score do I need to get into the school of my choice? How am I gonna balance finding time with my friends? Um, you know, the COVID-19, that's um, an issue big in the last year that's really affected our teenagers and they kind of worry about it. There's a big push now, you know, fake news, whether you believe it or not, but those are things that teenage, teenagers talk about. And they talk about, am I good enough? Just like poor old Charlie Brown. Um, life is hard and emotions are hard to control. So they're not so much different if we take the time to remember our teenage years. You know, some of the topics we, you know, we get in the schools where we teach is um, that cause conflict between the parents is overuse of phone or technology. When they're old enough to decide things for themselves, what they need, what they want. Um, you might hear you're too strict. Oh, curfew, I should be able to stay out. You know, so-and-so could stay out later than I can. Why can't, and sometimes, you know, we will say things to our teenagers, like, why can't you be like, and fill in somebody's name? 
Um, you just don't understand. You're not wearing that out of this house. You never have time for family. Or they might tell us, you're too old to understand. Does that sound familiar to any of you out there? So how do we change the patterns? How do we, how do we make the transition from how we grew up and the things that we had conflict with our parents over to change to make it better between us and our teenagers? Well, what we have to start about um, is really is looking at the patterns that we experienced growing up and what did you like that your parents did? You know, were your parents very good at talking with you, allowing you to express yourself safely in a safe environment and you felt like you could tell them anything? Or did you grow up in an environment where like there are certain things I would never tell my parents because they would literally kill me or kick me out of the house or I wouldn't be welcome. Um, so what are some things you would like to see changed or different than with your parents? And we are not talking about um, agreeing on everything because face it, we are not gonna agree with a lot of things with our teenagers. We are not talking about allowing disrespect. We are not about um, not setting healthy boundaries, but we are just talking about how can we keep those communication paths open even when we don't agree, or even when we don't like what's being said. So we're gonna navigate some of the pitfalls in communication, and we're gonna learn what some of those pitfalls are. It's like walking across the bridge and there's some boards out, you know, how are we gonna fix those boards so we can safely, um, safely walk that bridge that divide between us? Um, and some of the next few slides are taken directly from our Love Notes curriculum that um, we teach to high school students. And uh, many of our educators, if you're on the call, you will recognize these. But the first one is to learn to reduce, stop, and exit out of negative patterns. And some of those are like put downs. That's basically name calling. But we all do them. Um, we do them too much. And that then they become the main pattern of interactions and they're gonna poison that relationship. And once it's poisoned, it's possible to rebuild it but it becomes very difficult. Um, escalation, it's when things just get heated and they get out of control or it gets, um, starts out, you know, here and you get here and you get here and then neither one of you is listening to each other or it just gets nasty, nastier and nastiest. Um, negative interpretation is you always, you can't see past the one mistake that each of you made so everything is seen through that filter. You know, the filter of their mistake, you always assume everything and that's how your communication, you always have to go back in the past and say, well, you know, you did this one time, so how can I trust you? Um, name calling is just not okay. Name calling is just never okay in any communication, in any relationship. But hopefully we can learn, um, we're gonna, talk to you about some skills that can help reduce that. Because what we need to understand, our brains are amazing, is an amazing organ. And, but when we're angry, it does what the brain knows to do to protect ourselves. Anger is seen by our brains as um, danger. It doesn't understand whether something's chasing you like a wild animal. It sees anger as emotional danger and it pulls the plug and it floods your brain full of um, hormones that are meant to protect you. And so your lower brain becomes reactive. It's that fight or flight impulse. And remember that's where the teenagers operate the most comfortably out of because it is the most mature part of the brain during their teenage years up until they're in their mid 20s. And so once that kicks in, your cortex or your higher thinking brain, the frontal lobe um, there, where logic, reasoning, perspective, problem solving take place, it's shut down. Your body's just like, I just need to, um, 
I just need to protect myself. But guess what? Once our uh, frontal core, core, frontal lobe matures, then we can self-regulate. Then we can stop that lower brain from reacting in anger. You know, you can feel yourself getting angry. Your voice may get louder. It may get higher. Um, your fists may clench. You may feel your blood pressure going up. And teenagers at that time aren't really able without um, a lot of practice and intention, able to stifle that. But as an adult, when we're trying to talk to our teenagers, we need to be able to self-regulate ourselves and turn back our higher thinking brain so we can reason and, and think about what we're getting ready to say, calm ourselves down. Because let's face it, most of our arguments are really over something very small. Everyday events of life. Something happens, one of you does or says something that sets the other one off. And part of that negative interpretation is, oh, you did that just to get on my nerves, or you did that just to make me have a bad day. Well, you know what, when I got up this morning, the, on my mind was not, how can I make so-and-so's day terrible? That was probably not their first thought, but that's part of, you know, being able to kick into our frontal lobe and say, ah, you know what, that's not really their intention. And the arguments, um, if you keep having the same ones over and over, we need to explore those um, and see what's really going on. Because sometimes if it's the same argument, it may seem like it's something over something silly, like, you know, your teenager continually forgets to put their wet towels in the basket or, you know, fill in your blank because you're probably here because you have teenagers or will have um, quicker than you think. And so there might be issues below the surface going on. And the mountain looks really, really calm. It's kind of like the iceberg for the Titanic. But what you don't see is there's a huge problem underneath the surface. And um, in a lot of arguments, there might be jealousy, um, there's issue with friends, um, work or school, responsibility. Maybe you just, maybe you're struggling as a parent. Um, maybe there's financial issues going on. Maybe your teenager is struggling with assignments or the pressure of wearing a mask and not being able to socialize during COVID. You know, everything, um, especially this last year, everything gets, um, it feels more, the emotions are more, whatever the emotion is, it's more, because it's so difficult to navigate this time. And then what happens is an argument erupts. You know, it doesn't take much of an event to push your button and kaboom. So how can we um, stop the kaboom? The unfortunate reality is many people have issues or problems. And oftentimes the only time we, we talk about them is when something triggers it. So sometimes the only time we communicate with our adolescents is when there's an issue. There's no sitting down, just chit-chatting during the day. Um, you know, that's the only time we're like, oh, they're teenagers. They spend so much time in their room on their devices. It's okay. You know, they're kind of like they're out of my hair. I'm busy. I'm on my phone. So the only time we really talk is when there's an event and we have a big kaboom. Um, and then we both get mad and we know that anchor brains aren't smart brains. But here's the reality, if we only deal with an issue once it explodes, it's like taking a can of um, soda pop and you shake it and you shake it and you sit it down. And if you open that pop, it's gonna spew out, not only all over you, but everybody around you and make a sticky, icky, awful mess that has to be cleaned up. And nobody gets to enjoy the soda. But if you let that soda settle down and calm down, which is switching back from our limbic brain to our prefrontal cortex, then we can open it and we can drink it. And it's a sweet drink that does not cause a mess. So how do we do that with our conversation? How do we do that? 
But here's the other thing too. It's important to keep the communication lines open because adolescents make decisions that can impact their entire lives, which is what a lot of us are afraid of. They're gonna make the wrong decision. Being able to provide guidance and influence during these years is paramount to helping them reach their goals. And it's so worth your effort. I know some days it feels like throwing your hands up in the air and going, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. I'm just frustrated. We're gonna give you a technique for that to calm yourself down. But trust me, continuing persistence, patience, intention, intentionality, it's going to be worth the effort because you're going to bridge that divide and have a good open communication line with your teenager. So when they do have the difficult subjects, when there are the hard things, they will come to you as their trusted adult and say, let's talk about this. So what are some practical steps? I know you've been waiting on this. One is, oh, guess what? Take a time out takes you back to your smart brain. Now timeouts are just a little bit different than what we might think. And you can use this whether the other person decides to use it or not or to engage with you. But in order for our teens to learn regulation, we must model self-control in front of them and self-regulation, even if they don't. Um, and this is a really simple technique. Um, I, I know you say this will never work for me, but trust me, I've had experience with the teens in my home and it, do, it, won't, it doesn't work perfectly the first few times, but it will work if you're consistent with it. And it's also the number one technique that teenagers when I taught in classroom said, I wish my parents would allow me to use this technique. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Um, the timeout technique gives you a way to calm yourself down, but it takes discipline and practice. It's not about counting to 10 and taking a few deep breaths. There are important rules and steps. And here's what you do. You say, we or I need a timeout. Use I or we statements. Because if I look at you and I say, you need to take a timeout or you need to calm down, what does that do to you? Hmm. I don't think so. Can you see your teenager with a little head bob and the little eye roll? Like, uh-uh, it, it puts you on the defensive. So you didn't need to say, I need to take a time out. I'm getting ready to do or say something that I'm not going to be proud of. So I need to, I need to back away for a little bit. I need to disengage from this conversation. Step two is go do something to calm yourself down. Be careful that you don't go away and think, well, I'm going to tell them this and I'm going to tell them that and I'm going to do this argument and I'm, I'm going to have a comeback for this. No, go calm yourself down. Um, I will tell a story on my son. I hope he is not watching this. Um, when he was um, an older teen, we, we butted heads because we're just alike. We like to have the last word. Um, and we were going at it one day and, you know, a friend of mine said, Rita, you need to try this technique. And I'm going, that will never work for us. We're both too stubborn and, and pig headed. So I had had enough getting ready to throw my hands up. And I said, you know what? So I said, you know what? I'm going to back away and I'm not going to talk to you while I'm angry. I need to go calm down. So he followed me around the house trying to engage me back in the argument. Because remember, we both kind of secretly, evilly <laughs> enjoyed that. Um, and I continually did it until finally he backed away. And the next time it was very quick, you know, I need to back away. I need to go calm down because I'm angry. And it's okay for your adolescent to know that you're angry. And it's okay for them to tell you that they need a timeout, that they need to go and, and calm down. That's the part sometimes we forget. We will follow them to their room. But, you know, let them have that time out to calm down. That is part of the maturity process and the growing process of their brain. Let them calm down. Calm yourself down. Think about what are, what are we really arguing about? Is it really about that you forgot to take out the trash again? 
or do I feel like you disrespect me or you not, you don't understand how much work I have to do? Find out what's the hidden issue. And then remember that I am important, the view. I am important, I'm valuable, I'm important. My, um, what I have to say is important, how I feel is important. And then wait at least 30 minutes. Um, the view is I am valuable, I am important, I am equal and I am worthy. Then wait at least 30 minutes, but no more than 24 hours to come back and talk. That's the difference. You always need to come back and settle the issue when you're both calm. That way it's not an issue that just keeps getting put to the side again, again, and again, until it becomes at a volcano pressure and it erupts. Um, and give them time to cool off. And say, yes, I'll give you time to go calm, calm down, but can we meet back in about 45 minutes and discuss this issue? And I promise you that it will be calmer. Um, you both will be operating in your better brain for logic and compromise and being able to actually hear each other. And it might minimize the things that you say or do that would hurt each other. The other technique we call it is a speaker listener. This sounds really easy too, but you really have to be intentional about it because sometimes we're really, really good speakers, but we're not good listeners. Um, and really um, the speak, the timeout technique, um, sometimes, you know, we keep sweeping the problem under the rug, um, but you need to come back and, and deal with it. But what will keep it under control? Certain issues raise a lot of emotion and a lot of heat. So the speaker listener technique is really good for those. Because really, when you're in a discussion or a heated discussion or an argument, whatever you want to call them, you know, we can say the little, oh, we're just having a discussion that got loud. Now you're having an argument. But uh, this one will keep it, um, keep it a little more softer. Because really what you want is to be heard and acknowledged. Trust me, teenagers tell us they wish their parents would really, really listen to them. And that's something that as parents, we really don't understand. We think they're not listening to us at all. They are listening. Um, but, and the number one influence over teens today are their trusted adults. That sounds easy, but here's the catch on the speaker. I'll get back on track here. The speaker listener technique. Um, the listener has to listen so well that she or he or she can paraphrase or repeat back what, what they heard in their words. I hear you saying that you're upset that your friends didn't let you sit with them at lunch. Then the speaker has the opportunity to say yes or no. But what do we usually do as listeners? We're like, oh, we're either fixing the problem. Already, you know, we already decided we understand it and we wanna fix it. Um, and we're thinking of things we can tell them, but to listen is just really listen, don't interrupt, don't disagree, because by listening, you're not saying, I agree with, your, with you, you're saying, I acknowledge, I want to hear what you have to say. And it's hearing beyond the words that are being spoken. It's hearing the heart of your teenager. Um, and you can ask for, you know, if, if they say no, well, can, can you tell me in a different way what you're feeling and help them identify their emotions. Now, as the speaker, speak for yourself. Don't assume you know the motivation behind the issue because you don't. Don't go on and on, which is really, really hard. Teenagers tend to do this because they think you didn't hear them the first six times they said it. So as, as the adult, be very, um, work on this technique to just listen um, and let the listener paraphrase, give the listener time you know, to absorb it and stay on one topic, stay on one topic.
don't throw in everything because guess what? If you've ever been in an argument with a spouse or with a friend, they start bringing up everything that happened five years ago. That just creates an argument that nobody is happy. Nobody is heard. Nothing is resolved. So just stay on one topic. Speak for yourself and don't mind read the other person. Um, rules for the listener, have big ears. Don't dis disagree, give your side or interrupt. Try to understand, paraphrase and ask questions. I don't understand. Can you say that in a different way? And the ultimate goal for this technique is for both people to feel heard and understood. This is very good with very, very difficult subjects. And it counters all the danger signs. It keeps it, um, the um, disagreements calmer. Um, there should be no name calling that's allowed here. Um, the intention, the motivation is not um, mentioned because remember you can't mind read somebody else's motivation. And then what are, if there are things that really need to be brought up, that really need to be dealt with, how do we complain to be heard and not ignored? To get our point across without alienated the one we are attempting to communicate. Um, and I'm going to ask for a couple of volunteers. And if Hillary will help me with that, I'm going to ask um, two pairs of people. Well, I'll just have a pair of people to pick one of these scenarios and one of you pretend to be the adolescent and the other one, the adult. And let me hear how this might play out in real life. Do we have both? All right, y'all gonna make me pick people because I see y'all. <laughs> I can't see you, so I can't pick you. <laughs> Cassie. You care to volunteer? Or voluntold? <laughs> How about just some of our gang? Y'all know us, it's fine. Cassie, Danielle, Brennan. Jim and Sean, y'all want to go? Hello, by the way, I miss y'all. <laughs> Hello, guys. Um, right. I can allow you to talk if I need to. If nobody wants to do it, we won't volunteer them. But here's, think in your head how it would actually, between parents, either on sitcoms or in your own life. Have a couple. Oh, yay. Thank Hang you. on. Thank you, Danae and Cassie. Thank you, Danae. Thank you, Cassie. I'm trying to figure this out. Hang on. Hang on. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. If my dogs start barking, just ignore it. That's okay, because oh. dogs bark when we have arguments in the home. That's right. You're right. And it usually makes angry brain worse. Yes. And it upsets everything and everybody around you. Right, Danae, I got you as well. I think you should be able to. Who's going to be the teen? Who's going to be the adult? It's up to you guys. I, I feel like this is, a, I was going to say, I feel like this is a Cassie's the teen, Danae's the adult situation. <laughs> <laughs> I do hang out with teens more. And then Danae plays the mother role more. So. All right, pick one. What did I choose if she's here? Danae, are you there? Hillary, would you care to step in with um, Cassie? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, there she is. Oh, there she is. Yay. Uh -huh. Sorry. Sorry, it took a minute and then my two year old started screaming because <laughs> I was out of the room. Perfect. <laughs> um, Okay, cool. I can I can be mom. I had my, my eight year old tell me she was a preteen and so she could act this way. So <laughs> pick any of those scenarios you think you can um you pick one, Danae. 
Oh, geez. Well, dirty dishes are what we've been doing today. So we'll go with Perfect. the dirty dishes and the wet towels. <laughs> All right, go for it. I can't believe you left your towels under the bed again. We've had this conversation how many times now? I don't understand why it's such a big deal. Because it causes dirt and mold and it's nasty and it stinks. Your whole daggone room stinks. You need to get to cleaning and you need to take care of your stuff. My dogs like it when it smells. They smell. And so what's the big deal if they just go and roll around in the blankets? They like it. So I, I'm too busy. I've got homework. I've got sports. I have to take showers because I'm playing the sports. You want me to just quit the sports? I don't understand. It's just not a big deal. You just need, I don't understand why you think it's such a big deal. Yeah. If you can't take care of your towels, you can't quit the sports. And you I'll just quit. And I'll just forget all my scholarships then, mom. Well, good. You need to forget all your scholarships if you can't do your job, can't take care of your stuff, then how are you going to go to college? How are you going to be able to maintain those scholarships? You're going to fail school if you can't even put dishes in the sink. It's not just like I can it. To just forget it. And I want to slam the door shut in your face. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Give our volunteers a round of applause. Thank you, ladies. I love you. I still love you today. Still love you. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm outside. My neighbors probably think I'm nuts. Well, well, my, dogs, my dogs got really concerned when I raised my voice. They were like, what, what's going on, mom? Are you okay? Well, don't go away because I'm going to call you guys back for the same scenario. Okay. So okay. we saw some bad ways to complain, mind reading. Like, we didn't really see that in this scenario, but hey, I don't know why it's a big deal. You're just making it a big deal. They didn't really name call, but they assumed, um, you heard Danae say, you're just like, you, you're you never, you don't take care of your stuff, which is you're irresponsible, which is what our teens say when we hear, you know, when we hear those words, they internalize them like, I'm lazy, I'm not good, I'm, um, I'm just terrible. Um, they blamed each other, you know, well, I'll just forget everything, it, you know, well, I won't get my scholarships. The kitchen sink, they started bringing in all these other things. I'm just going to quit sports. Well, that wasn't even the topic of the conversation. Then they started cross complaining back and forth with each other. So what's a better way to communicate? We call it the superhero or the super wrestler. And so the WWE is the WWA. What happened? We focus on the specific... We focus on the specific behavior that bothers you. Remember, it's one behavior, not many. The when or where or the last time it happened. Avoid you always, you never. Explain how it affected you, how it made you feel, why it bugs you, why it upsets you, or why it makes you mad. Um, educators on this thing will see this is straight out of the book that we teach the teenagers in our classes. Um, and I also took a couple examples um, out of our book that I, I changed. This is a, an exercise from our workbook with the teenagers do, but I changed, um, took the liberty to change some of the examples. Um, when you went to the party last night after I said no, I felt betrayed because I trusted you. I explained that I didn't feel comfortable because no adults would be present. And the what is you went to a party not you always go to party or you always stay out with your friends. It's you went to the party after I said no. And it was last night. That was the win. And, you know, the parent is saying, I felt betrayed because I trusted you. Compare this with if you go to your teenager, there you go again, always sneaking out, never listening. I should have known you're so irresponsible and rebellious. The ineffective way is not going to get you anywhere. It's going to shut down that communication line immediately. They're not going to want to even try. Um, if, you know, I'm never listening, they're, you know, they're just hearing so much that I'm not enough. I'm never, I'm always a, a failure. I'm always irresponsible. I'm always rebellious. They internalize that. But when you tell them you went to the party last night after I told you no, and I explained my reasons, that kind of keeps it from escalating. You're not calling them names. You're not, you're just, you're bringing up a specific, a specific action and why it's, um, why it needs to be dealt with. And like I said, we're not talking about not having boundaries and not having respect and not having consequences. We're talking about how do we keep that communication line open so we can deal with those things. 
The next example is when you left my car's gas tank empty again on Sunday, I felt like you didn't care about my time and tight schedule on Monday mornings. The extra stop caused me to be late for work and I was reprimanded by my boss. The what is, you left the gas tank empty on Sunday, when? And it made me feel like you didn't really care about me or my time. Uh, it's better than you never listen to me or do anything right. You just don't care about me. Okay, we're gonna skip this part. Um, and practice general starts. How you, how you raise an issue says a, a lot about how things are gonna go. Don't start um, issues when you know you're both hungry, when you're tired, when there's something emotional that's been going on that day, um, when they're stressed out anyway about maybe um, a test or something. So gentle starts, how you raise an issue and when you raise an issue are very important with your teenagers. And be careful about how hard you come down on your children because you will crush their spirits. You will break that bridge of communication to where they don't feel like it's a safe place to come and talk to you anymore. You have to learn to authentically communicate with your teenagers to build that quality um, relationship. Express your frustration quickly, but take a time out rather than letting it escalate um, into an unproductive, unproductive argument. Set a time to talk after you calm down and ask yourself if there are any hidden issues. And really nine times out of 10, if you just explain to your teenager why you have a concern, because remember they're not toddlers. You know, a toddler, you can't really set them down and say, don't stick the fork in the electrical socket because there's surges of electricity and it'll, you know, you just need them to know, no, don't. Teenagers, remember we're helping build, build those logic, logic connections with the back of their brain. They need to understand the thought processes. And even though they don't act like they're listening to you, they really are. And you're helping them to learn to use logic when they make decisions about, oh, I remember mom or dad or my trusted adult, my auntie, you know, told me that this is the reason. Oh, I get it. I get it. We're gonna watch this next video that I thought was very, very interesting. Hopefully you do too. I can get it to play here. Are there any questions so far on what we've gone over? Any comments? Here we go. Communicating with your teen can be very challenging at times. Teens are developing independence and have their own opinions and ideas. Though arguments and disagreements about minor issues like keeping their room clean and computer use are normal, the day-to-day -day conflict can be challenging and even a bit difficult for parents. You may think these daily disagreements are an indication that you are not a good parent, but know that your teen sees this as a way of expressing his own ideas and becoming independent. Some degree of disagreement can actually be beneficial as it helps them to develop communication, negotiation, and conflict resolution skills. Be honest and open with your teen. Research shows that the more honest and open you are, the more likely your teen will come to you with their concerns and problems. Parents can use certain strategies that open the lines of communication and enhance their relationship with their teen. Here are some strategies and tips that you can use when talking with your teen. Look for opportunities where you can talk together, such as in the car, while you're eating supper, or just while you're enjoying any activity together. Though it's not the preferred method of talking, try using technology like texting or instant messaging. This lets your teen know that you're open to new ways of communicating. Use effective and positive communication techniques like eye contact, being polite, and active listening. 
pay attention to what they are saying while recognizing their moods and feelings. They may have difficulty talking about their feelings and understanding their emotions. This lack of awareness may be in part due to the increasing use of social media and electronic communication like texting and the internet, where face-to-face -face interaction is minimal. Help them identify their feelings by naming them. Sometimes they won't want to talk. Try a pat on the back or a touch on the shoulder and let them know that you care and that you're ready to talk. Use the sandwich technique by praising and using positive comments on either side of a concern that you might have. For example, if the problem is missing the bus, you may say something like this. Usually you get up really early and you're very organized in the morning, but you've missed the bus twice this week. Let's talk about what's going on and try to get you back on track. I know I can trust you to work on this with me. In this situation, you've pointed out the positive by saying that they are organized and that you trust them to work out the solution, and you've highlighted the issue of missing the bus in the middle. Avoid yelling, interrupting, blaming, or criticizing, no matter how difficult it may be. These will only push your teen away. Ask open-ended questions so it gives them an opportunity to expand on comments and ideas and gives you more information rather than just yes or no. An example of an open-ended question might be, what did you do at lunch today? Help them problem solve instead of giving advice that they didn't ask for. This helps them to think for themselves instead of relying on you to tell them what to do. Let them know that you are willing to talk about all subjects in a respectful manner, even if you may feel uncomfortable. And let them know that they are loved and valued no matter what their opinions and ideas. In our busy culture, it is too common to be isolated from one another. Find ways to connect with other parents of teens through your faith group, school, sporting events, or work. Compare notes and share ideas in order to support and learn from one another. Check out different information at Parenting Workshops and credible online sources. For more information, see our video library on parenting teenagers at Okay, let's see if I can get back to the PowerPoint here. Okay, we're going to, I know Cassie and Danae will be highly disappointed, but we are running a little bit late, so we're going to skip the, the rest of the scenario play. But um, here's the thing we need to know. Bridging the divide between teenagers and ourselves in communication, it really starts with the adults um, because how we handle ourselves, the words we say, our behavior and our body language determine the health of our communication relationship during uh, with our adolescents. We have to model the behavior that we want to see and it takes practice and intentionality and persistence um, because, you know, we want to be that role model. And here's the other thing. When we mess up, and notice I say when we mess up, because we will, and we'll lose our cool, and we'll say things that we wish we hadn't said, apologize. Let them see that we, the adults in their life, are vulnerable just like they are. Um, and an apology goes a long way towards um, them feeling safe. That, hey, my mom, my dad, my auntie, my grandma, whoever the adult is in their life, my coach, they mess up too, but they're willing to apologize. So to find talkable moments, remember the teens um, try to avoid eye contact. So have a lot of conversations while driving, uh, watching or playing their favorite show or game together. I will tell you, I watched a lot of really what I considered silly shows when my son was a teenager because that's where we could sit together um, and really and we would have lots of conversations and we still do he's an adult now but we have a lot more conversations when he's driving or we're watching tv together um create neutral situations for organic conversation ask them to help you to learn a new techie application ask them to help you cook or you know ask them why do you like this particular artist instead of going in and saying, why do you listen to that crap? You know, what makes you want to listen to this? What makes you like the sports team? Whatever it is, you know, 
kind of um, delve into their interest and why are they interested in that? And you will just learn so much about your teenager that way. So then when the hard conversations come along, you've already built that rapport. Um, participate in an activity with them, whether it's gardening, photography, disc golf, you know, whatever they enjoy. Or if they want to learn something that you're doing, but really it's not about you, it's about them. So that means putting yourself into um, finding out more things about what they like to do and maybe even trying to do it with them. Another thing is volunteer with their team groups, uh, whether it's like team parents or uh, your PTO, anywhere where you're around their friend groups, even if you go to track meets or ball games and you just kind of sit behind the group and just listen. When I was um, a softball coach in a high school and even in um, the little leagues, I learned so much just by listening to the conversations going on. Um, and give them 100% of your attention. Put down your own device. Put away, you know, don't take a phone call in the middle of a conversation with them. Let them know they're the most important thing at that moment. And show genuine interest, interest in what they have to say. And if that means going back to speaker listener technique, it's listening with nothing else on your mind. Because we know too that, um, you know, when they're toddlers, we talk about parallel play where they're doing, playing together, they're playing side by side, but not really interacting. Sometimes that's what we need to do with our teenagers. Be doing an activity side by side with them, but not really interacting. And then they will start to make those communication, um, um, those communication connections there. Um, use the, help them define their emotions. You know, I hear you're frustrated. It sounds like you're angry. Um, you know, start it gentle and let it go deeper as it will go. And sometimes there are difficult subjects that surface that make us want to stick our fingers in our ears and go, la, 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 I can't hear you. But this is when it's really, really important to control your eyebrows. And you know what I'm talking about. Control your face. Take a deep breath. And listen and listen, and listen again. Resist the urge to speak up or make a snap judgment or dive into your soapbox. Just listen. And that's gonna be difficult because you're like, I'm glad you told me this. I don't really wanna know this. I don't really need that visual in my head, whatever it is, but just listen. And then uh, ask open-ended questions. The goal is to keep them talking to keep them talking. Um, you know, you can ask questions like, how'd that make you feel? What do you think about that? Um, what could they have done in that situation to change the outcome? Um, forego advice. Don't give it unless they ask for it. And probably they're not gonna ask for it um, because ten, teens tend to talk a lot around the issue. And they'll go around it like, you know, circling the base of a tree, like, you know, the rabbit circles and the little beagle follows behind them, but they'll go around and around that tree. And then eventually they will come back and probably come up with their own solution. And guess what? That's when it usually sounds like something that you would tell them. And then that would be the nice place to kind of guide them if they didn't quite come up with a solution that, you know, that's when you can go back and ask open-ended questions. Why did you come up with that solution? Why do you think that works? Um, and validate their feelings. You had a right to feel that way. I understand why you felt mad. I understand why you felt hurt. Let them know that they're, they're, the way they feel matters. And then give them positive affirmations. And make them, um, make them genuine. Kids know when you're being not true. So be authentic. Um, like you were brave to stand up to that situation. You had a valid point. You have a strong sense of right and wrong. And then I found this quote that said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that is true. Teenage brains are not fully developed. 
parents and teenagers continue to struggle to communicate. But guess what? The struggle is only for a season if we handle it right as adults and if we're persistent and patient. You and your teenager can enjoy healthy relationships through adolescence. It's not a, it's not a given that you're not going to be able to talk. It is very possible. And here's the thing that you may need to hear. Your teen is listening, but what are you saying? Your guidance now um, is needed more than ever before. You know, we think we need, they need us when they're younger, but during the teenage, pre-adolescence, adolescent years, um, they really need us to be engaged in their life. It's not a time to step out. It's not a time to give up. It's not a time to say they're just teenagers. That's the way they are. Understand what is going on in their body and their brains. Learn some techniques to keep those communication lines open. Know that you're not going to agree on a lot of things, and that's okay. But be able to talk in a respectful manner. Because how you handle yourself, the words you say, your behavior, your body language, and your focus will determine the communication between you and your adolescence. And your adolescent is worth the patience and persistence. It is so worth it. You will be so glad because when they, were, when they become adults, you will have a sweet, sweet relationship with them where they can come and talk to you. And, um, and when they have kids, we all know they'll be like, oh, mom, you really did like me a lot. You really did love me. And I put you through some really hard times, but it is so worth it. So with that, do we have any questions? Oh, Melinda, I love that. I'm on Zoom on my phone picking up my teenage boy. I can't wait to see expression when he hears what's going on. <laughs> I love it. That is perfect. And my oldest son learned to step away like that. It helped with lashing out. It absolutely does. But we have to be their first models. We're their first models for a lot of things, um, for all of that. I said I'm doing a good job. You are doing a good job. You're doing a good job with your son. Any questions or comments? We have some time left if you have any. Like I say, I'm not um, the definitive answer for everything, but um, I think there was some, some good stuff in there. Uh, a lot of the videos were very, very good. The Love Notes curriculum is amazing. And just know that your, your teenagers, um, they want you to be involved in their life. And if you have teenagers under your sphere of influence, you know, show a genuine interest in them. You might be the only trusted adult they have in their life. Maybe they don't feel like they can go um, to their parents or um, we call them raisins, the adults who are raising them. So maybe you would, you would be that person that they can come to and talk to, you know, mentor those young people in your life. Well, Hillary, I'm going to hand it back to you since we don't have um, seem to have any questions and let you um, end them for us today. All right. Well, that's really all we have. Thank you guys for participating. Thank you, Cassie and Danae. You did a fantastic job. Um, yes. Everybody else, our gang, it was uh, good to have you on here today. And those who are visiting us for the first time, we hope you'll come back. We have our, um, like I said earlier, our virtual conference coming up in two weeks. So check out our website um, and look for more information on what we have going on. But thank you all. And thank you, Rita. You were fabulous as always. Well, thank you. I hope something I said helps. Listen, I'm in here taking notes. Me and my <laughs> 11 year old and the very first thing I thought I told Kelly and I'm like we are having movie night and watching Inside Out I forgot about this <laughs> yes it's a lovely movie I'm just like I need to go this is my life right now I've got to <laughs> love 11 it's been fantastic all right thank you guys we'll have see. a good one